I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Well, thanks for joining us on the Memorial Day Monday. Uh, make sure that you take a minute through today as you go about your holiday routine to remember why this is Memorial Day. Give thanks for those brothers and sisters that have gone before us that have given their lives to defend the freedoms that we enjoy now. Now, on to the show. Um, well, we've kind of been uh, putting things off the last couple of days. I've spent the last two days on the range instead of prepping for the show. So we really don't have a script written out. We really don't have your questions set out and ready to answer. So um, we're going to shift things just a little bit. Um, yesterday, we shot one of the local matches. Um, I've just got my wife's match rifle back together. And uh, she got to come out and shoot the match with me. Now, I figured this would be a really good time to go over one of the match rifles that I built up and why I use the components that I use. Now, this right here is a mid-level rifle. Um, we didn't spend a huge amount of money on it for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is my wife's first match rifle. I wanted to build it up in a manner that would not limit her, but would allow her to decide if she enjoyed shooting rifle matches with me before we sunk a ton of money into building a custom rifle up for her. So this, I figure, is a great example of your average tactical rifle match rifle. We'll go through it from front to back and give you guys an idea of the components I have on it right now and then I'm going to break it down and talk to you about each individual component. Um, at the front we've got a JP compensator on here. This is one of their larger tactical muzzle brakes. Coming back this is a Remington 700 ADL varmint barreled action. Um, nothing special just an off-the-shelf barreled action. This is an XLR Industries Evolution chassis that we've got it set in. The bipod underneath is a Harris BRM 6-9 uh, notched leg bipod, and we have a pod lock underneath it from KMW. We have a Weaver 20-minute angle rail, TPS rings, a Bushnell Elite Tact I'm sorry, Bushnell Elite 4200 Tactical. 6 to 24 by 50 power. And underneath here, we've got your standard Remington Xmark Pro trigger. The bolt knob is a KRG Ops bolt lift. And that is about it. That's the basic configuration on this rifle. Now let's talk about the individual components. First, I'll talk about the barrel to action. Now, when I started building this rifle, I knew that we were going to use some kind of chassis system. So there was no reason to select a rifle that already had an expensive stock on it or a bunch of accessories. I wanted to go with a Remington 700 because I'm a Remington 700 armor. I know how to work on these things. I've been uh, dealing with them for quite some time, and I've got a lot of spare parts laying around for them should we possibly break something on it. Um, anything that happens with the rifle I can generally fix pretty quickly. Now the configuration that we went with, the Remington 700 ADL Varmint is one of their cheapest heavy barrel rifles that you can find on the shelf. Uh, it comes with a plastic stock, it has no bottom metal, it just has a trigger guard. It is an ADL which means that it has no floor plate underneath it. When you need to unload it you have to remove your cartridges through the top. Uh, this is a horrible, horrible, horrible idea for a match rifle because at the end of a stage, you almost always have to clear your rifle, remove all the ammunition from the magazine, and clear the chamber. Um, when you do this, you want to be able to do this quick so you can either pick your gear up and move on, or you can get set up for the next stage, or you can take a drink of water, get off the gun, and take a break. Um, the ADL just does not allow you to do that quickly. That, and it has one of the cheapest, piece of crap plastic stocks that Remington makes on it. That really, it, that stock has only one purpose and that's just to give you something to hold on to when you touch a round off shooting at a deer or groundhog or something. Um, not a good idea at all. However, I knew we were junking all that. 
I just wanted the heavy barrel and I wanted the action. Now the action and barrel that is in the ADL Varmint, the bottom end cheapest rifle they make, is the exact same action and barrel that is in the top end Remington 700P. The only difference between the two is the finish on the barrel. The ADL has a matte blue finish. The 700P has a parkerized finish. Everything else, the receiver, the bolt, the barrel, is the same. So really all you're paying for the difference between the 700P and the ADL is a little bit extra quality control and the accessories, the stock, the trigger, etc. Didn't need any of that, bought the ADL, saved some bucks. Um, you can actually buy the ADL varmint for cheaper than you can buy a bear, a bear action from Brownells. Now the ADL varmint comes as a standard 26 inch barrel. As you can see, looking at this rifle, this is not a 26 inch barrel. Um, after shooting it for a little while, we realized it was really an overly long rifle. It was starting to hinder movement when you have to get in and out of portholes and barricades and that kind of thing. Uh, there's no reason to have that super long 26 inch tube. Uh, we went ahead and we had suppressed armament systems, cut it back to 20 inches for us and thread it for a break. I knew we wanted to use a break because in tactical competition you very frequently have to shoot from very bad positions. You don't have the ability to get squared up perfectly behind the rifle before you fire your round. Uh, you may be shooting off a barricade, you may be twisted up in obstacles, and a break will assist you in keeping that rifle on target through recoil. It also lessens the impact that you take when you touch it off. Now 308 is not a recoil monster but it's more than sufficient to push you off of target so that you totally lose the view of the target through the scope if you don't have some kind of recoil compensating device. Uh, we want the JP brake because it is a very effective brake. I was actually looking at it before I came across a good deal on one used. Um, this is the larger version of their tactical compensator. Um, they do make a smaller one, but they claim that the larger version is just as efficient as their large tank brake. My wife's comment was it drastically reduced the recoil of this rifle and made it feel to her more like shooting a 223. So to take a 308 down to the level of a 223, to me that's pretty good. Moreover, it accomplished exactly what I wanted it to accomplish, and that is to keep her mind more in the game and stop her thinking about what's going to happen when you press that trigger and the rifle recoils. Um, smaller statured shooters, lighter bodied shooters, tend to be less resistant to recoil than some of us who are a little bit chunkier. Um, I, I can take some pretty decent recoil and not really notice it because I'm so intently focused on what's going on with the actual target itself. However, you will notice at the end of the day, after shooting a couple of hundred rounds, that you're getting fairly fatigued from getting battered from that rifle. So for long strings of fire, the compensator will actually help that. The drawbacks of the break is the added concussion that it creates. Instead of all that blast going downrange where there's nothing for it to harm, it now vents out to the sides. Um, when you are shooting in an obstacle where you may have concrete walls next to you, if you're shooting in a culvert or something of that nature, when you pull that trigger, that muzzle blast is going to reverberate off any barriers and reflect back to you, and it will definitely make a difference. Um, if you're shooting in any kind of obstacle like that and you're using a brake, make sure that you double up your hearing protection. Uh, it just it will make a world of difference. Uh, the other disadvantage to it is you will make enemies of the shooters on either side of you if you're using something like this JP break. Uh, it will pick stuff up off the ground and blow it around. Uh, it will really blast shooters on either side if you've got a situation where everyone on the line is firing at the same time, which you'll have at most matches. Uh, so bear that in mind. Uh, they may want to put you down at one end or the other where you're away from everybody else. Now we come back to the bipod here. The Harris BRMS has been a longtime favorite of match shooters. It is a very good value in a bipod. There are cheaper bipods, there are more expensive bipods. Um, 
I think the cheaper bipods really end up being a waste of money in the long run. Once you break them, once you damage them, or once you realize that they just do not work the way you wanted them to work, you're going to end up throwing your money away and buying a Harris anyway. Um, I use an Atlas on my rifle because I prefer the added features that the Atlas gives me, but you pay for those added features. Uh, the Harris is a great middle of the road. I have several of them on other rifles. Uh, the things that you want to look for when you're purchasing a bipod on a match rifle. First and foremost, you want swivel. You want to be able to drop that rifle down and instantly with your eye and your body square the rifle up to the horizon to get the rifle level. If you get something that's not a swivel, then you're going to constantly be fiddling with the legs to try to get that rifle level or you're going to end up shooting it with it canted. This is a bad thing. You want to make sure that you have a bipod that allows you to swivel the rifle. Now on the Harris, if you get a swivel model, a pod lock is highly recommended. I don't use pod locks so much to actually lock the rifle, although you can lock it to where it does not swivel at all. I like the pod lock because I can set the tension of the swivel. So I can set it to where I can swivel it all the way over to one side and leave it halfway in between and leave it straight up and down and leave it and it will stay where I set it without any input from my body that's what I prefer there are a lot of other shooters out there that like to level the rifle and lock it off the pod lock gives you the option to do any of those it also gives you the option to really kick it over to where it is just loose as can be I'm not quite sure why you want that that way but it's all about options and the pod lock gives you quite a few so if you go with the Harris BRMS bipod, definitely spend the extra couple of bucks for a pod lock. Now, there's a lot of new shooters will get out there and ask, do I need a notch leg or do I need the smooth leg bipods? Absolutely go with the notch leg. The reason you want the notch leg is if you drop down and you get on a surface that's uneven, let's say one leg ends up higher than the other, well, yeah, you can compensate by tilting the rifle, but you'll eventually get to the point where it's so high you can't compensate by tilting it and that's going to give you a nasty position because you've got almost all the weight on one leg. With the notch leg bipods, it makes it real simple for you just to level the rifle out, hit the release, and that leg will lock in and now you've got a nice lockdown solid position. You can't do that with the smooth leg. With the smooth leg, you have to actually reach out with both hands, pull the leg out with one hand, turn the thumb screws to lock it down with the other hand. Also, when you get ready to roll and you need to collapse the leg, it's very easy just to push it, snap it back in, and you're ready to roll. So definitely go with the notch leg on a match bipod. You can get away with the smooth leg if you know you're just gonna be shooting off of flat concrete pads, flat concrete benches, that kind of thing. But especially if you're shooting in grass, mud, dirt, rocks, anything like that that's an uneven surface, the notch leg are a much better option. Also, for you law enforcement or military shooters out there, don't goof around. Get the notch leg, just a couple of bucks more, and that's what you need for your type of shooting. Um, talk about the chassis here real quick. Um, the XLR Evolution chassis we received uh, a couple of years back to use for a T&E. Uh, we did a write-up on our website that goes into detail on the features of the rifle. That's on 8541tactical.com. Just uh, hit our articles or our reviews tab and you can go through and see the XLR chassis review. It is an excellent option. Um, I really like the design of this stock because a lot of shooters that we're seeing nowadays are used to the AR-15 type platform. If you're used to the AR-15 type platform and you're moving over to a bolt gun, this rifle feels like an AR-15. You've got the same angle pistol grip, you've got your tubular forend, you've got a similar AR style buttstock. In fact, on this chassis, you can actually put the same buttstock on this chassis that you have on your AR-15. Um, it will bolt right up. It uses a standard AR receiver extension thread. So that's one of the great benefits of it. 
Now, as you see up here, we have three Picatinny rails uh, on the chassis. Now, these don't come with the chassis. They're purchased additionally through XLR Industries. Uh, they really aren't needed for match shooting. The main purpose of the rails on this rifle was so that I could attach camera equipment to either side. I can attach a contour or GoPro camera on either side, and the rail on top is actually a holdover from when we were T&E in this with the local police department. Uh, it allowed us to mount their night vision device uh, ahead of the scope. So the rails, you can put them on anywhere you want, if you want them, if not, you don't need them. When you come back, an additional advantage of running a chassis system like the XLR is you now have the ability to put a 10 round magazine in to the rifle. Uh, if you shoot competition, a magazine system is almost mandatory. Um, you can shoot competitions with a top, top loader with a five round box magazine. Uh, you're going to work very hard and you're going to be at a disadvantage on anything that is timed. Uh, a lot of the stages, especially at the local matches, are 10 round stages. It means you're going to have to shoot 10 rounds under time. Um, I'm pretty fast single loading a top loader, especially when I have a stock pack or something back here with cartridge loops where I can yank cartridges off and throw them in. However, I'm still faster with an internal magazine system. Now, if you go with a standard stock, you're going to have to purchase a magazine system additionally. You also have the option of doing something like a Manners um, mini chassis that comes with a magazine system in it. But when it's all said and done, you add it up, you're going to end up very close to the cost of a lot of the chassis systems that are on the market. So just keep that in mind. The magazine releases right down here, just like most standard AI style magazine systems. Uh, we come back to the pistol grip, use a standard AR-15 pistol grip. The only uh, difference between this chassis and a standard AR-15 is if your pistol grip has a duck bill, you got to cut it off. Now the XLR comes with the Ergo Tactical Deluxe overmolded pistol grip as part of the package. I like this pistol grip so much that I actually converted it over on my Precision AR-15s and my AR-10 to the Tactical Deluxe grip. It's an extremely nice grip, has a really fat palm swell on it to get your hand wrapped around. It feels very nice. Coming back here, this is XLR's Tactical Buttstock and it's fully adjustable. Comb height is adjustable, length of pull is adjustable, the height of the butt pad is adjustable. Basically, you can adjust the stock any way you want to adjust it. Now, this is a key part when you're shooting a match rifle. You really want to be able to get the whole system dialed in to where you pull the rifle into your shoulder, it feels like home. It just feels right. At that point, you don't worry about the system anymore. You worry about what you need to do to put that bullet in the target downrange. So being able to tailor the chassis specifically to your body is great. Now when you start moving down into the smaller statured shooters, it's an even bigger deal because a lot of them have to make compromises. The stocks are built for an average sized person. If you're smaller than that, then you're starting to reach to try to get to things. You're craning your neck because of the length of pull, etc. So if you're a smaller shooter, Chassis systems are going to allow you to reduce the length of pull. They're going to allow you to really dial in that comb height and get the rifle set up for you. Uh, that's one of the key reasons we went with this chassis system for my wife's precision rifle. Now we come back up to the KRG Ops bolt lift. Uh, we got one of these a while back and it is an extremely nice piece. Uh, it's one of those that's a very simple design that does its job extremely well. You'll see the vast majority of tactical rifles out there have these great big huge Mongo bolt knobs on them. Well, the advantage of a big old Mongo bolt knob is it's easier to hit with your hand when you need to cycle it. It's easier to reach up and grab the knob. Um, a lot of them are textured, so you're less likely to slip on it in the rain or in the wet. And 
it gives you a little bit extra leverage to crank that knob up or down if you get grit or nastiness into the action. Well, the disadvantage of a large tackle bolt knob is you've got to send your bolt off to a, somewhere, uh, a gunsmith, a factory, etc., and they have to either cut off the bolt knob, drill the handle, thread it for a stud, and put your new bolt knob on, or a lot of them will just grind down the knob to a cylinder thread it, and then screw the new bolt knob right on that. Well, the factory Remington bolt handles have a tendency to have voids in them, and that can actually weaken the whole system, and you can end up with a serious problem. You can end up with a bolt knob breaking off in your hand and uh, a spent casing now jammed in the chamber. Um, additionally, you may be on the fence, and you may not know if you really want a big bolt knob or not. KRG Ops Bolt Lift allows you to try out a large bolt knob without the permanent investment of actually having one of the other knobs like a Badger threaded on here. Now, we put it on here to try out to make sure that the chassis geometry and the hand placement uh, supported the larger bolt knob. I have problems with traditional stocks when I get my trigger finger straight that the top of my trigger finger will actually rub on the bottom of that bolt knob. Uh, with pistol grip stocks, I generally don't have that problem. Uh, but you still wanna try it out before you make the investment. So we put the bolt lift on there, everything cleared. We started using it and realized there's really no reason to invest in a actually screwed on bolt knob. Might as well go with the bolt lift and just keep it on there permanently. Now we didn't do the permanent installation. If you want to install one of these permanently, you can squeeze some epoxy in there and tighten it down and it'll be there permanently. Um, we just kept it screwed on mainly because I just wanted to see if we'd ever have a problem with that screw backing out. And so far we have not. Uh, it's been on here for quite some time now with no problems at all. We'll come up here to our uh, scope base. We used a Weaver 20 minute scope base. Uh, this is the same base that we use on our budget precision project, so you can actually go check our budget precision videos, and I'll talk a little bit more about this base in there. But it's high quality, it has a recoil lug, and it has 20 minutes of angle built in. Those are the key things that you want to look for. You want to make sure you have that recoil lug built in because it gives you a little bit of added strength and added resistance to the scope moving around, or the scope base moving around on top of the receiver. 20 minutes of angle are necessary because some tactical matches, you may be shooting at five yards, you may be shooting at a thousand yards. You want to be able to maximize the elevation that you have available in your scope, and you want to try to keep the crosshairs as close to the center, the optical center of the scope, as possible when you make those adjustments. It gives you more windage travel, and it also puts you in that sweet spot of the glass where they're most clear and you have the most optical resolution. So, I always recommend a 20 minute base. The only exception to that is if for some reason you had a scope that you were greatly attached to that was not able to zero at 100 yards with a 20 minute base, or you were using some kind of mounting system on top of it that already had cant built in. You don't want to start stacking cant because you can run into a really bad situation where you can't zero your scope at anything under 400 yards. We did not go with a Seekins or a Badger on this system because we were trying to hit that price point. We were trying to keep this as a mid-level. Um, if I was building this up to fly cross-country and shoot top-end matches, then I would have gone ahead and put a Seekins or a Badger on it. Uh, the Weaver is fine. However, the Seekins or Badger is not that much more expensive. And once you make the investment, it's done. You don't have to worry about it again. Uh, when you're paying thousands of dollars to fly across country, stay in a hotel, food, rental cars, all that stuff, an extra hundred bucks on a scope base is not a big deal. Same thing goes with the mounts. These are TPS mounts. Uh, we went into depth on the TPS mounts in the budget precision series. They're a quality set of rings. They are not top end, but what you give up to get them is a little bit of fit and finish. Um, I think the top end rings, Badger and Seekins, are using a little bit stronger materials and a little bit better techniques when they machine them. However, the TPS rings are great. They work fine. We haven't had to worry about them on this rifle, and I would really be surprised if we have any failures with these rings. Again, if you're flying cross country, you're spending that extra money, 
an extra hundred bucks is cheap insurance because if you have this rifle bust all that money's forfeit so if you're doing that if you're flying spend some extra money Seekins or badger and you'll be good to go now we come up to the scope on here as i said this is a bushnell elite 4200 tactical 6 to 24 power this scope has been recently replaced with the bushnell elite tactical 6 to 24 Slight change in title there, almost exactly the same scope. Uh, the difference is the Elite Tactical has more elevation travel and the Elite Tactical has white markings. You can now get the Elite Tactical with several different reticle options. This is a standard mill dot scope. Um, what I would suggest is if you're looking for a scope right now, highly look at the G2 reticle in the Bushnell Elite Tactical line. It is an excellent reticle. Um, we'll get into that a little bit in a later video. Uh, hopefully I'll have one of those scopes in to review at a later point. We went with the uh, Elite 4200 6-24 basically because Midway had them on closeout and had an excellent deal on this scope. Uh, it has what you need. This is a mil radian turret. They're graduated in 1 tenth mil clicks and a mil dot reticle. Now, mill dot reticle is not ideal for shooting matches because you have one whole mill between dots. The dots are two-tenth mill dots, and it really makes you work to get those uh, breakdowns if you're doing holdovers or if you're doing range estimation. But that was the only reticle available in this scope at the time. We wanted to make sure that we had matching turrets and reticles, so it's a mill radian turret, mill radian reticles. And the power selector is 6 to 24 power. Now, 6 to 24 power is an acceptable range for a tactical rifle scope. The 6 power gives you low enough that you can get moving targets or get your field of view large if you're transitioning between unknown distance targets out on the field. 24 power allows you to really crank up for those precision, uh, know your limits type shots. And having 24 power, you may not always be able to use it. You may have times when the mirage is up and you have to back it down a little bit to get a clearer sight picture. However, on the days that you don't have heavy mirage, you have the ability to go up to 24 power. If the extra magnification is not there, then obviously that is an option that you don't have at your disposal. So 6 to 24 is a good power range for this type of scope. Um, it has parallax adjustment from 25 yards to infinity, Parallax adjustment is something that you really want on these type of scopes. Uh, a lot of times match directors will throw a stage in where he's coming inside of 100 yards. And you really want to be able to dial in so you can actually see your 25 yard or your 50 yard target. Um, if you're shooting in inside 50 yards, you're probably going to have to drop your power. Uh, you're probably not going to shoot at 50 yards at 24 power and actually be able to get a clear sight picture. So just bear that in mind. 50 millimeter objective and illuminated reticle on the scope allow you the ability to shoot low light stages if the match has one. Not a lot of matches run low light stages, so really the illuminated reticle can go away. Um, the 50 millimeter objective. And that's just a result of the design of the scope. Most of these tactical scopes in higher magnification are going to the larger objective. That way you still have a nice bright sight picture when you crank it up to 24 power. It doesn't get dim like some of the lower end scopes. The Bushnell Elite 4200 Tactical is a good mid-level scope. Uh, it gives you exactly what you need for shooting tactical matches with the exception of the mill dot reticle. Uh, the mill dot reticle again is not ideal you'd much rather have something with a little bit finer breakdown uh, in between the mill graduations. Now, the only thing left on this is the trigger. I left the trigger for last because this rifle still has its Xmark Pro adjustable trigger on it. Um, actually, I take that back. This one is the standard Xmark Pro. It is not the adjustable trigger. Um, the reason we've left this trigger on here is because when I built the rifle up, I tore it down, cleaned up the adjustment screws, adjusted it to a nice crisp three pounds, and left it there. And it's been there ever since. Uh, the trigger has not crept up. We haven't any problems with it. It breaks clean. It breaks at the weight I set it at. You don't need anything else. 
they haven't had any problems with reliability. Uh, so there really is just no goal for us to replace this trigger at this point. Now, if the trigger starts to have problems, then obviously we'll replace it right away. If you have an Xmark trigger that you can't get to an appropriate pull weight and it's all over the, the board, then replace it. But if you have one that works, there really isn't a goal in replacing it. These triggers actually have a fairly nice trigger pull when you get them set and you get them dialed in. Um, the trigger weight on this is set at three pounds. There's no reason to go below two pounds on a match rifle. Uh, you'll hear guys out there that are going down to a pound, uh, half a pound under that. It's just really not safe on a tactical rifle. You can get away with it on a bench, ri bench rest rifle. Bench rest rifles, dial in that two ounce trigger. It's not a big deal. You're only going to load the rifle when you're getting ready to shoot. As soon as you fire the round, you're going to unload the rifle. Most bench rest rifles are single shot rifles anyway. So it's not a big deal. On a tactical rifle, there may be stages when you're moving with a loaded rifle. Uh, not a lot of matches do that. Most matches will require you to be magazine out bolt back when you move. But if you have a stage that you need to do that, you want the rifle set up to be able to do it. You're not gaining much of an advantage at all in tactical rifle shooting with a super light trigger. In fact, I would say that you have a bigger chance of having a problem. Uh, negligent discharge can very quickly get you disqualified from a match or popping off a round when you're behind the rifle and you weren't perfectly lined up, that'll cost you points. So I don't see any reason to have a trigger below two pounds on these rifles. Um, for that, the uh, Xmark Pro, the Xmark Pro adjustable, the old factory Remington triggers, Timney triggers, um, they all work great. Um, they're all, you know, in or about the same price range. Uh, if you need to replace an X mark, look at a Timney. Uh, if we ever have a chance where we need to replace the trigger in this one, uh, it will probably get a Timney trigger. Um, we may have some other triggers that we're going to check out here in the future that I don't have any experience with, so um, stay tuned for that. But I believe we've covered everything on this rifle. This is a basic match rifle. Uh, again, the key component here is the chassis system. It allows you to dial the rifle in to you so that you're no longer thinking about the rifle. It makes the rifle an extension of your body. Um, you can get the same thing with composite stocks, but you're going to add the expense very quickly. So don't think that you're going to save money going to a composite stock over a chassis system. Um, you really end up being about the same price range in the end. And what it may come down to is lead times. A lot of times chassis are available quicker than the composite stocks are. So look both ways and try to get behind them and see what kind you like. A lot of people just really don't like the chassis systems. They much prefer the feel of the composite stocks. And that's okay too, as long as you can adjust it to your body type. Well, that's about it for the show. I know we kind of slacked off and... Uh, didn't really do our regular question and answer for this segment. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, please leave your comments in the comment section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. Please send us questions for next week's show. Uh, we'll make sure we go back to question and answer next week so that we keep rolling and answering your questions, which is, of course, the whole purpose of the show. Uh, if you're a subscriber, Thank you. If you're not a subscriber, please make sure you click the subscription button above. It doesn't cost you anything. We won't send you any junk mail, and YouTube will let you know when we release the new videos. So, when we screw up and we don't get Mail Call Mondays out until Tuesday, YouTube will let you know. If you like the episode, please make sure you click that thumbs up button below. If you dislike it, leave a comment and let us know why. And, until next week, get out and shoot! Still there again, huh? Okay, since you guys stuck with us, 
Go ahead and check out some footage that we shot with the Contour camera at this weekend's match.